from Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. I'm David Weston, and welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. Thanks. To, oh, l late yesterday, President Trump really responded to the crisis at the Capitol by in a recorded address in which he said he condemned the people who stormed the Capitol and at the same time, for the first time, acknowledged there would be a new administration taking over come January 20. A new administration will be inaugurated on January 20th. My focus now turns to ensuring a smooth, orderly, and seamless transition of power. Okay, we welcome now our political contributor, Jeannie Zeno of Iona College, to respond to what has been an already extraordinary week. Jeannie, uh, the president did say there's going to be a new administration. I noticed he never used Joe Biden's name, and he certainly didn't congratulate him. Now he says he's not going to the inauguration. Is this what we need for an orderly transition of power? It's a step in the right direction. I mean, we should say that, um, you know, in the two hours ago, he also, as you know, tweeted the 75 million great American patriots who voted for me, America first, and make America great again, will have a giant voice long into the future. They will not be disrespected or treated unfairly. And so we're seeing, once again, the video on the one hand, which is a sharp contrast from what he was saying the day before, and then followed up just several hours later by these kinds of tweets, and then, as you mentioned, tweeting after that, he will not be attending the inauguration. I think one of the many questions that I have is whether the president is not only going to try to pardon himself and members of his family and inner circle, but whether he, in fact, will try to pardon these people who charges are being leveled against already who stormed the Capitol uh, on Wednesday. In, a, in the meantime, just a few minutes ago, we heard from the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, who referred back to what happened with Richard Milhouse Nixon back in the 60s when Republican leadership went for the Hill, went to White House and said, you have to step down. She said, that's what Republicans should do now. If they don't, she said, Congress would act. Is that realistic at this point, given the short period of time we have left? I think the most realistic, realistic path is what she said. Republicans, respected Republicans, Mitch McConnell, Mike Pence, you know, uh, Pompeo, people that he respects, his children, family, need to go to him and make this happen. That is the path forward. I have a hard time believing at this point that Pence will invoke the 25th, and it is just incredibly difficult to imagine that they could get an impeachment and a removal done in 13 days. Could they do it constitutionally? Yes, there's no time frame, but it would be incredibly fast historically for them to act on something like that. So I think she's right. That would be the way to do it. Republicans need to step up. Now is the time. In the meantime, Jeannie, you'd be the first to say there comes a point where we need to start thinking about the future and what happens after January 20. What do you make of what President-elect Biden is doing right now, in both in what he says, how is he responding to this crisis, but also in his appointments? I think his response has been on point. I think he should stay away from discussions as to what happens in the next 13 days about uh, with, with President Trump. I think he was right to condemn, obviously, the violence, but I think he needs to think ahead. I mean, let's not forget, today we had bad news on unemployment. We also had bad news in the last couple of days, increasingly bad news on the number of deaths due to COVID. He needs to be focused, number one, on the health crisis that has you know, destroyed aspects of the health of this country for the last year, and also it has had an incredible impact on the economy, education, everybody from young children to the elderly. He needs to be focused on that and what he's going to do when he hits the ground running on January 20th. Okay, Jeannie, thank you so much for putting a very difficult week in perspective. That is our Bloomberg political contributor, Jeannie Zeno of Iona College. Well, against the backdrop of the crisis in Washington, the government released an unemployment figures for December today, and they showed a loss of 140 40,000 jobs overall, but they did revise November, November numbers back up. To interpret these numbers for us, we welcome now Simona Makuta. She is State Street Global Advisors Senior Economist. So, Simona, what do you make of it? I, it looked like the markets, at least initially, said maybe it's good news because it means we're going to have to have stimulus. Yes, I think um, I'm confident that from a macroeconomic perspective, 2021 will be a much, much better year than 2020. But clearly, we are not going to go from here to there in a straight line. And I think this report reminds us of that. Um, at the same time, you have to point to a single cause for, for this disappointment today. It's COVID. If we were not looking at the surging case numbers, if we did not have to implement mobility restrictions, we would have been looking at a very, very different report, right? So um, it's a it's a 
soft patch, I do not believe is necessarily a single month soft spot, but also I don't see this weakness extended beyond two months, perhaps three at most. Well, uh, because vaccines are coming and pent up demand will, will materialize. A, a single cause, but even more specifically, it looked to me like the numbers really, it was all in a leisure and hospitality. And specifically, I think restaurant workers were a greatly disproportionate number of the lost jobs. You are absolutely right. Every, you know, in fact, there were parts of the report where we were pleasantly surprised. Uh, even business services, I thought, was was quite strong. I, I'm wondering whether the strength continues into January and February, but you know, serv uh, services is is weak in parts of services, right? It, it's certainly leisure, hospitality, places where it's not so much that people don't want to spend or they don't have the money to spend; they don't have the physical capacity to spend. So that's a very different calculation. Meanwhile, construction, manufacturing. Um, other parts of services are, are doing okay. So that's very reassuring. So that raises a question, just the way you put it right there. How much help will these stimulus checks that are on their way out right now really give us? Because as you say, it's not so much that people don't have the money necessary, they physically don't have the ability to spend it. Well, let me qualify this statement because I think there are some people uh, for whom the availability of funds is an issue. And that's where you most um, you most 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 intensely need that those stimulus checks. Whether those that those funds will be spent immediately, I and how they will be spent, where they will be spent, uh, I think it's an open question because you may get the money and you may be willing to go out, but if you cannot, it's you know you'll have to wait. So it's probably possible that the benefit of these uh, stimulus checks materializes a little bit down the line. Um, my expectation is that given the numbers, uh, COVID numbers we are looking at, chances are mobility restrictions extend rather than go away over the next few weeks. In fact, Massachusetts announced just yesterday that some of the measures they implemented post Christmas will be extended by two weeks. I don't think Massachusetts will be the only state doing something like this in the next few weeks. So let me come back to where you started us, which is that you think overall in 2021, we're going to have a recovery. Are you looking at a negative GDP number for the first quarter? And if so, what are you looking for in the second quarter? Well, I'm not looking at the out, outright negative number for the first quarter, but I'm looking at the weak number for the first quarter. Nothing, um, you know, a, a small positive number, uh, single digit. Uh, second quarter, it's a much better number. Third quarter, a much better number. So you get the ser service sector momentum, that pent up demand, uh, delivering, delivering through the system um, as you progress through the year. So it, I don't think it's impossible to envision a first quarter negative print, something small. Um, I don't have that in my forecast as of now. Okay, Simona, always great to have you with us. That's Simona Makuda, senior economist with State Street. Now let's get a check on the markets. Joining us is Kaylee Line. So, Kaylee, how are the markets processing what is extraordinary week, including these jobs numbers? Yeah, happy Friday, David. <laughs> it has been a very long week, and despite everything we have seen this week, culminating, as you rightly point out, in a disappointing jobs report today, the equity markets are poised for a weekly gain. Granted, the picture is a bit more mixed in today's session, specifically the Dow is lower, but both the S&P 500 and NASDAQ are higher. Tech stocks really outperforming on the day. By and large, investors looking past the bad news, maybe even seeing it as good news that disappointing payrolls print could mean more stimulus coming and of course that is what the market is betting on with the democratic sweep we saw take shape this week that more robust stimulus will come under democratic control that reflation trade has really roared back that is evident in the bond market again you are seeing yields climbing higher today price uh, yields up three basis points 1.1 percent is where we sit that is 20 basis points higher than where we were on Monday David a note of caution here though while bonds and Equities are showing that reflation trade. Take, keep an eye on Dr. Copper because copper futures are actually lower only by about four tenths of 1%, but that may indicate a little bit more concern about the growth outlook than equities and bonds are telling us. Now, as far as other things that are lower today, the worst performing sectors 
in the S&P 500 are the financials and communication services. On the bank side, you have the likes of JP Morgan and Bank of America, lower B of A, down by about 1.5%. Both of those stocks hit their highest since February of last year. Yesterday, a little bit of steam coming off that rally. And then in communication services, your big drags are Facebook and Twitter. Caught in the political crosshairs once again, of course, Facebook has uh, suspended President Trump's accounts until through at least the duration of his term through the next two weeks or so. Twitter temporarily did suspend. Uh, they are undergoing pressure now to elongate that ban. And of course, the events of this week have put into perspective the policies of Facebook and Twitter. Now you have lawmakers, other groups uh, really all across the country saying they acted too late, putting regulation back in the spotlight. Many saying the events we've seen unfold this week make the case that these companies need to be monitored more carefully. And as a result, those stocks are down in the ballpark of 2% today, David. Kayla Lines, thank you so much for that report on the markets. Coming up, what comes next on Capitol Hill from Democratic Senator from Minnesota, Tina Smith. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for Bloomberg First Word News, and for that we go to Karina Mitchell. David, thank you. The House will move to impeach President Trump if cabinet members fail to invoke the 25th Amendment and remove him from office. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says she is still waiting to hear from Vice President Mike Pence. She says she'll proceed with action if Mr. Trump doesn't resign. Pelosi says she's also spoken with the senior most U.S. military official about Trump and the safety of nuclear codes in his remaining days in office. Meanwhile, when President-elect Joe Biden is sworn into office on January 20th, President Trump will not be there. The president tweeted today to all those who have asked, I will not be going to the inauguration. On Thursday, Mr. Trump pledged a smooth, orderly and seamless transition of power following the violent breach at the U.S. Capitol earlier this week. Trump will be the first incumbent president since Andrew Johnson to skip his successors swearing in. And more than 4,000 Americans died from the coronavirus yesterday. That breaks a record for deaths for the second consecutive day, according to data compiled by Johns Hopkins University and Bloomberg. More than 277,000 new cases were reported across the country. That's among the highest numbers for the entire pandemic, as states report a surge of cases following the holidays. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Karina Mitchell. This is Bloomberg. David. Thank you so much, Karina. A new Congress tries to regain a sense of normality after the shocking mob attack on Wednesday. Welcome now one of those doing the nation's business. She is Democratic Senator from Minnesota, Tina Smith. So welcome, Senator. Good to have you with us. There are shocking events, but let's look forward just a little bit here. We do have a new Congress. We're about to have a new mm -hmm. Senate where there's a 50-50 split that Kamala Harris as vice president will be able to break a tie on. What are your hopes and dreams for what can be accomplished in this new Congress? Well, you know, I really appreciate this question. And I'm noting, as I heard uh, the opening to our conversation, uh, the, the tragic news that we lost 4,000 Americans uh, yesterday, I think is what it was, uh, to COVID. And that, to me, is a reminder of the important, crucial work that we have to do in Congress when we all come back together on uh, January 21st. Now, I'm in so enthusiastic about my new colleagues from Georgia, and it is, of course, as a Democrat, I'm very excited that we were going to have a, um, a very, very slim majority in Congress, and it's going to be incumbent upon us to take that majority to accomplish things for people. You know, here in Minnesota, we are in the midst of what is a, you know, we have dark winters anyway, <laughs> and this is going to be a long, dark winter. So I am looking forward to the work that we can do to respond to this COVID pandemic. There's so much more we need to do. Uh, and then, like, think about where we can go from here at this really important pivot point in our country, in our public health, um, in, um, and in our democracy, as we saw so tragically last, uh, just a couple of days ago in, um, in Congress and in the, in the White House, excuse me, and in the Capitol. 
So, so I'm from Michigan, so I know about those winters. Believe me, <laughs> I've experienced right. them myself. So let's talk about the, the pandemic and, and the awful situation we have across the country. As you say, a record 4,000 deaths in one day. Uh, what is there left right now for Congress to do? You just passed that stimulus bill, which included a fair amount of money, both for vaccination programs and also for testing. Is there a lot more there that needs to be done right away? Well, first, I think we need to make sure, working with the Biden administration, that we have a national strategy to get those vaccines out to people. Clearly, that hasn't happened like uh, we all would have hoped um, in December. The goals of getting 20 million people vaccinated fell far short. Uh, I love that uh, President Biden, uh, President-elect Biden, has laid out a goal of getting 100 million Americans vaccinated in the first 100 days of his administration. And that is going to take a full court press. It is going to mean he needs to consider doing things like invoking the Defense Production Act, bringing in the National Guard, bringing us all together to make sure that that happens. And, you know, the optimist in me is hopeful that as we do that together, that that will help to start to mend some of the uh, the damage that has been done to our civil society over uh, the last uh, few days and the last few weeks and the last many years. And Congress has a role to play in that. But, you know, one other thing I just want to mention as I think about what we need to do here in Minnesota and around the country is that that COVID uh, relief package, which we passed, included an eviction moratorium that actually expires on January 21st. It is an example and a symbol of the deep work that we still need to do to make sure that people are able to keep their houses, that they don't lose uh, their apartments, that we don't have greater homelessness amongst those that have lost uh, their jobs and have lost a way to, of, to take care of themselves. Uh, so there is much more work, I think, that we can do together in Congress. And I'm hopeful we can do that in a bipartisan way. You know, we saw some pretty incredible bipartisan work that led us to this last COVID relief package. So uh, we need to go back to work on that. Well, I want to come back to, to the last few days and what happened up on Capitol Hill and, and just get your sense about whether at this early stage it may actually change the discourse up on Capitol Hill, maybe even make it easier to get them things done because people maybe on both extremes might rein in what they're saying and some of their positions to yeah. try to work together. Goodness knows it showed how fragile our union really is. The reality that democracy doesn't just happen because it always has happened, that it is something that we have to protect and work for, I think was on full display. That reality was on full display in our nation's capital on Wednesday when we saw an armed and violent mob um, literally uh, take over the legislative branch of our government for a few hours. And what you said about words and how maybe toning down the rhetoric, I think, is really important. You said a little earlier, before we got on, about how words matter, uh, something that Barack Obama said you were repeating, which I appreciate, because I'm hopeful that some of my colleagues saw the impact, the consequence of the words that they have been using, the way in which they've been feeding this fire of lies around our elections and that they will understand that they have to be more careful and that the, the threat that we are under right now is not a Democrat or Republican threat, it's an American threat. Uh, as leaders, we need to come together. And I, I feel, again, as an optimist, I am gonna be counting on that and working for that. Uh, in that spirit, uh, do you have any concerns about the moves that are afoot to try to get President Trump out of office before the inauguration? You've come out in favor of that. We heard from Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House. We've heard from others, Chuck Schumer, whether it's the 25th Amendment or impeachment. Is that a way to really put this behind us and go forward together? I think that the question is, how do we demonstrate to ourselves, to our country, to the world, that there are consequences in America when you challenge and you threaten the very foundations of our democracy? And that's what happened on Wednesday. The president of the United States incited a mob to attack the legislative branch, and that's what they did. And if there are no consequences for that direct attack on our democracy, an attack on our public safety, I believe also on our national security. If there are no consequences for that, how do you move forward? 
that is the spirit that drives me. It is not a question of, of sort of punishing Republican or, or you know Democrats and Republicans. It's about showing ourselves that you cannot with impunity attack the foundation of our democracy and just have nothing happen. Yeah, terribly important. Uh, there will be consequences, I suspect, no matter what happens as a practical matter. Thank you so very much. Always great to have you with us. That's Senator Tina Smith. She's a Democrat from Minnesota. And a programming note now, Wall Street Week airs tonight at 6 p.m., we will have former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers and Christina Hooper of Invesco among our guests. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for Stock of the Hour. And if it weren't a pun, I would say the Tesla is on a roll. As the shares now have gone up above $800, it is now, believe it or not, the fifth largest U.S. corporation. Here for a full report is our colleague Emma Chandra. Yes, David, Tesla notching up another record today, a gain of close to 8%. It's actually gained about 23% just this week. It's on an 11-day rally, so that straddles the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021. And you mentioned the share price there, close to $900 just 103 days ago. That share price was some $200, David. Uh, perhaps uh, that the most emblematic of uh, showing how the friend, we've seen this frenzy in Tesla shares over the last uh, few months and indeed, of course, the last year or so. The company could soon be knocking on a trillion dollar valuation. It is at about $800 billion uh, at the moment. And I wanted to put that in some perspective for you, David. That means that Tesla, Tesla is worth more than GM, Ford, Daimler, BMW and Volkswagen combined and then some. It really is a spectacular rise for the electric vehicle company. And we've also seen this week two sceptical analysts, David. They've capitulated. Uh, today, hearing from Evercore's McNally, upgrading the, company from, uh, uh, upgrading the company to a hold and saying they've been on considerably the wrong side of the story uh, for Tesla for more than a year. Yesterday, we heard from Joe Spack at RBC saying he had get he had got the stock completely wrong. Uh, now, of course, all of this has been pretty good for the founder of Tesla, Elon Musk. Just this week, uh, we've seen him being, uh, get the mantle, I suppose you could call it, of being the world's richest person. It's probably the fastest wealth creation uh, in history. Some $165 billion added to his fortune in just the last year. Uh, some trivia for you, David, as well. I wanted to talk a little bit more about Tesla. It went public back in 2010. The stock price has risen uh, more than 23,900 percent since 2010, David. I must say, I don't think I know how to calculate a 23,000 percent increase. I'm not sure if you gave me a calculator, I could do I that. Say, I didn't do that calculation myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure you could. Okay, thanks so much to Emma Chandra for that report on our stock of the hour, which is Tesla. Coming up next, the head of New York's largest hospital group, Steve Corwin of New York Presbyterian, is here for a report. First, on how our hospitals are doing in New York and across the country. And also, secondly, on where we are on vaccinations, with a sense that actually it's lagging where we should be in getting everyone vaccinated. Steve Corwin is going to bring us up to speed on what he's seeing here in the New York area. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Karina Mitchell. David, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says she's spoken with the senior most U.S. military official about President Trump and the safety of nuclear codes in his remaining days in office. She also says Congress will move to oust him from office if members of his cabinet don't invoke the 25th Amendment to do so. Pelosi says Trump is, quote, unhinged, and she's concerned he would access nuclear launch codes and order a military strike and wants Pentagon officials to take precautions. Dominion Voting Systems is suing former Trump campaign lawyer Sidney Powell for $1.3 billion. The voting machine company is accusing her of defamation. Powell was fired shortly after a November news conference in which she claimed agents from Iran and China infiltrated Dominion machines to switch Trump votes in favor of Joe Biden. She also claimed the software had ties to the late Venezuelan dictator Hugo Chavez. 
and all passengers arriving in the UK will be required to prove that they don't have coronavirus. Under new rules announced today, travelers will have to show a negative test result taken within 72 hours of the start of their journey. The government says anyone who doesn't produce evidence will be fined. This week, Prime Minister Boris Johnson put the country into its third national lockdown as infection rates soar. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Karina Mitchell. This is Bloomberg. David. Thank you so much, Karina. COVID-19 cases continue to surge around the country with daily fatalities now reaching 4,000 as of yesterday. And some hospitals are near the breaking point, even as vaccination programs st are struggling to keep up to speed. We welcome now Dr. Steve Corwin. He is the leader of New York Presbyterian, ranked the number one hospital system in New York and number five in the country overall. Thank you, Dr. Corwin, for being with us. Let's start with the situation in the hospitals. How badly stressed are they right now? How badly stressed is your hospital system? Well, hospitals across the country clearly are stressed, and depending on the location, you've seen uh, now what's happening in Southern California, other parts of the country. Certainly, rural hospitals have a great deal of difficulty because they don't have the ICU resources that large centers have. Uh, and we're clearly seeing staffing shortages around the country. And the reason for that is, uh, in the springtime in New York, when we were uh, under significant duress, we were able to get staff from around the country, from our sister uh, health systems and so on. That's not possible now. So we're at about a third of the cases that we had uh, in the pandemic in March, April timeframe. Uh, but we're starting to get stretched now in terms of our resources. And we expect that we'll have uh, a, a significant surge over the next week or two, uh, uh, given the Christmas and the New Year's holiday, as others will. So I think it's going to be a pretty dark rest of January into early February, uh, and we've really got to sort of buckle up. Uh, on the fortunate side of the equation, uh, I do think uh, with the incoming Biden administration, there will be a renewed focus on this, uh, not only testing and tracing and care, uh, but also on the vaccine rollout. Uh, so I would anticipate as we get into the April-May time frame, uh, we'll really see significant improvement. But we're going to have a tough few weeks ahead of us, David. One of the things that we saw starting last spring as the data started to come in is the disproportionate effect that this disease tends to have on black and Latin, Latino communities, and particularly uh, uh, American Indians as well. Uh, are there yes. special efforts being made here in New York or otherwise to try to address those specific needs? Well, it's very complicated because part of it is what were the underlying social determinants of health, uh, what's your housing like, what's your food security like. Part of it is, uh, did you have access to primary care? What was your condition before you came in? Uh, but there's no question uh, that this has disproportionately affected uh, uh, the uh, people of color in this country, the BIPOC communities, if you will, uh, by, uh, you know, Black, Indigenous, uh, et cetera. Uh, We've got to spend a lot of time and effort to make sure that that disparity is not exacerbated by the vaccine rollout. And what I mean by that is we also see a lot of hesitancy in these communities around taking the vaccine, uh, which will further add to the misery that we're already seeing. So we have to have an enormous uh, public relations, public service announcements, uh, discussions, answering questions. Certainly in my own hospital system, we're spending a lot of time uh, with our communities of color to talk about that because, you know, the history uh, for uh, black and uh, Latinx populations is they've been experimented upon. So you've got to get over that uh, hurdle, if you will, uh, to get vaccination rates as high as, as, as we need as a country. What do you see in terms of the demographics of the people you're admitting with COVID-19? Is there a disproportionate number who are black or Latinx? Uh, it depends, you know, David, it really depends on which hospital of ours you're talking about because the communities are so different. So in our in our upper Manhattan area, it's predominantly uh, Latinx because that's the uh, the local population in Brooklyn and in Queens. For those of your uh, uh, viewers who are familiar with that, very diverse populations uh, in our lower Manhattan location, which is close to Chinatown, a high proportion of Asians. So it really depends on on where you are. In terms of mortality, I think we're better than we used to be. 
Uh, certainly, uh, our mortality rate in the spring pandemic, March, April, was if you were hospitalized, you had a 20% chance of dying. That's probably in the 5 to 6% uh, range now. Still way too high, but our supportive care measures are better. Our ICU care measures are better. Uh, there are some therapies that have some effect. So we're better in terms of treating people, but the best way to sort of get to the end of this is vaccinate everybody, get shots into arms, and let's do it as quickly as we possibly can. So let's talk about what's keeping us from getting that done. First of all, just let me ask you, in your hospital system, what percentage of your healthcare workers have been inoculated at this point with the first dose? We're probably um, over 90 percent, um, and um, we're, we're very close to, uh, you know, uh, being able to move to the next populations. But I still think we have hesitancy in certain groups of our employees, particularly our service workers, uh, transporters, registrars, uh, and we're spending a lot of time and effort uh, with those groups to educate, to inform. Uh, my my uh, response to the hesitant ones is it's safe. Uh, we go through those issues. You're not being experimented upon. We go through those issues. If you're thinking of getting pregnant, now's the time to, to get it. Um, and, you know, to be honest with you, you deserve it. Uh, you're a frontline healthcare worker. You put yourself in harm's way for months and months. You, you deserve this. Your family deserves it. Uh, what is causing the delays, or at least perceived uh, delays, in getting the vaccine out and administered to the extent that was expected at this point? Is it because the, the rules are too rigid about the priorities? Yeah, I think so. I think there are a couple of things. First, one question will be, uh, do we hold back 50 percent of the doses? There are some studies suggesting that you can hold back less of the doses. I think the Biden administration coming in is, is looking at that. Um, so that you could uh, get more out there uh, from, from the federal uh, stockpile of this. And, and that would be of help. Now, having said that, uh, not to, to digress too much, you have to follow the regimen. The notion that you can get away with one dose of the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine is incorrect. I am uh, shocked that they've recommended that uh, in Great Britain. That, that is not what the science shows. Uh, the second thing is uh, is clearly that what you don't want to do is be in a situation where you've given all the shots and then you don't have supply for the second dose. Uh, and then the third thing you don't want to do is mix, uh, mix the vaccines up. If you get the Pfizer the first time, you get the Pfizer the second time. Let's follow the science. A two-dose regimen, the FDA has been very uh, strong about that. Uh, but with uh, uh, appropriate guidelines and knowing what the production facilities are, you probably can release more vaccine uh, federally, and that will help. On the guideline issue, I think we've got to loosen it up some. It's, it's not, uh, uh, what's the best way to put it, David? This, this is not a linear process. Not every healthcare worker is going to take it. Not every person over 75 is going to take it. You've got to move down the list very quickly. And quite frankly, what, you, what we absolutely ought to do uh, is get essential workers, people who, are, who have comorbid conditions, who are, who are patients, who are at risk. We've got to get this done as soon as possible. The goal here is 70% of the population. If we do it in too rigid a manner, in a linear manner, if you will, I, I, I don't think we'll get there. It'll, it'll dribble out. And so we've got to be very aggressive about expanding the criteria if the supply is available and expanding it very quickly, in my opinion. Finally, Doctor, uh, there's been some talk, including by some governors that you and I both know, about penalizing hospitals for not getting administered. Does that make sense to you? Not really. I, I really think that what you have to do is, you know, part of what happens is, and we talked about this uh, earlier, part of what happens is not everybody in the hospital wants to take it for whatever reason. I mean, uh, you might say, I'll take it tomorrow. Uh, I certainly would feel that way, but others don't. That's why I think you just the, the better part of Valor is expand the criteria quickly. Believe me, at this point, I believe we will have more national demand than we have supply. Therefore, let's get the supply out that we have. Okay, doctor, it's always such a pleasure and really helpful to hear from you. Thanks to Thanks. New York Presbyterian CEO, Dr. Stephen Corwin. Coming up, we hear from Richard Trumka. He's the head of the AFL-CIO about President-elect Biden's cabinet pick and how the Georgia Senate elections may change what he expects from the new Congress. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. To say it's been a big week in Washington understates it. From Democrats claiming two new Senate seats, giving them effective control of the U.S. Senate, to a mob invasion of Capitol Hill that disrupted the counting of the Electoral College ballots. For his perspective on what this all could mean for us, we welcome now back Richard Trumka. He's president of the AFL-CIO. So as I say, Richard, it's been an unsettling, a difficult week for us all. But in the same time, we are getting ready for a new administration to come in. Even President Trump late yesterday admitted there will be a new administration. Give us your take on a couple of the appointments that we heard about yesterday, where President-elect Biden is now named a new labor secretary and a new commerce secretary. What do you make of them? Uh, first of all, I think the, the President uh, Biden has done an incredible job of putting together a, a very skilled and diverse cabinet, not just diverse in the sense of ethnic background or race or gender, but also in the sense of economic uh, gender, economic diversity. Uh, Marty Walsh is a, an exceptional, he'll be an exceptional labor secretary for the same reason that he was an outstanding mayor. He actually carried the tools. He's a worker who came through the ranks and understand workers. I think he's going to do a, a great job. And I think you could say that about virtually every one of the picks uh, that uh, President-elect Biden has come through in his cabinet. It's the same, whether it's Pete Buttigieg at uh, Transportation, uh, Katie Ty at uh, Trade Rep. All of those have been just outstanding picks. So, uh, Richard, I've heard some reports that organized labor has some issues with Gina Raimondo, the governor of Rhode Island, because of what she did, I believe, when she was treasurer in reforming the pension system there. Uh, how do you feel about Gina Raimondo in commerce? Well, I, I think she's going to do a good job. Look, we, we, we've had some issues with her in the past, uh, but she's a, a solid, good person. She's more than qualified uh, to be commerce secretary, and we're excited. We'll work with her. And if we have any issues, we'll work through them. And I feel certain uh, that uh, if it need be, uh, the, the president-elect, who will be the president then, uh, will help us get through any of those issues. So we're not, uh, we don't have too much heartburn over that at all. So, uh, so let's come back to the two perhaps biggest events uh, affecting Washington. First, the Georgia runoff elections, both of them going to Democrats, which changes the balance of power in the Senate. And then, of course, that awful, awful assault on the Capitol during the counting of the ballots for the Electoral College. Uh, do you believe that that may change, actually, the course of this Congress? Does it change the dynamic up there on Capitol Hill as they look at possible legislation coming out of the Biden administration? Uh, I, I think it's going to have a profound change. Uh, I think uh, that winning the two seats in Georgia was a, was a sea change because it will allow uh, the Chuck Schumer to control the agenda of the Senate. Uh, confirmation of the cabinet will come quicker confirmation of judges and other things uh, will come quicker. Uh, I think it, had it been if Mitch McConnell was still in charge, uh, he would have tried to stymie uh, the agenda just like he did to, to President Obama. Uh, and so I think for the good of the country, uh, winning those two seats was a, was a good thing for the country, and I think we'll see the agenda move forward. So what particular parts of the agenda do you think move forward faster or go further? Well, the first thing, I think there'll be a, a bigger uh, program to take care of uh, the, the pandemic and the economy, a stimulus program. Uh, look, you're, you're starting to see the telltale signs right now uh, of the first CARES package, the, the stimulus bill dying. Uh, you saw 140,000 jobs go away this month. Uh, you see, still seeing over a million people sign up for new unemployment benefits. So you're starting to see uh, the fact that the CARES package or the stimulus package is dead, and the second one is too small. It won't pull us out of it. So the first thing we can do is, is that. The second thing is you'll see a concentrated plan and the resources necessary uh, to attack COVID-19 uh, and get everybody vaccinated uh, and get that uh, behind us so that we can start to normalize uh, the economy again. Uh, and then we'll move into legislation that, that's very important. For us, uh, the PRO Act uh, is very, very important because right now you have a tremendous imbalance uh, between employers uh, and workers when it comes to power. Uh, and we're never going to uh, get wages and inequality under control unless we give workers more power. And, and the PRO Act, which is uh, the Right to Organize uh, Act, the passage of that, uh, is very, very important for us. And you'll see that come up as well. 
Give us a sense, if you if you can, if you know, Richard, about your own workers whom you represent. You have so many of them. Uh, how many of them do you think have been inoculated at this point? Because you have some people who are frontline workers. We have significant numbers uh, that are nurses, doctors, uh, and, and health care workers. Uh, we've had a significant number of them uh, vaccinated. Uh, then, and then we haven't had many uh, of the other uh, uh, essential workers vaccinated yet because of the lack of, of vaccine that's out there. Uh, but we're hopeful that'll get done as well so that those essential workers can get protected. And, and again, David, I've talked on this show many, many times about the need for OSHA to pass uh, an emergency pandemic standard. And I think under the Biden administration, that's one of the first things that will happen. So workers will get some additional protection even before they're vaccinated. Well, that's an interesting question, because in the past you've said, let's include in the legislation to make sure OSHA does that. Are you not going to need it in legislation anymore because you believe that the new labor secretary will do it on his own? I think you'll see that the, the first week in office, uh, you'll see that the pandemic standard uh, be rolled out. Fascinating. So what is the number one most pressing issue for you as we go into the new year? Well, obviously, taking care of the pandemic. Uh, I mean, we're, we're at a terrible stage now. We lost uh, at a record day for people dying, over 4,000. Uh, the number of people hospitalized is at a record level. Uh, the number of people contracting COVID is, is at a record level. So getting that under control is important, uh, the essential thing. And that ties into the second thing, getting the economy back on track. You can't get the economy back on track, David, unless we first take care of COVID. And then when we do that, then we have to have a proper stimulus package that will start the economy, prime the pump, if you will, get the economy rolling so we can then create demand, which will create jobs. Yeah, as you always remind us, there are a lot of people who don't have jobs today who had them before the pandemic. Well, we're down about 26.1 million people are unemployed. We have about 10 million fewer jobs uh, than we did prior to the pandemic right now. Uh, and so you're seeing a tremendous number of people uh, that don't have the income they need, so they can't create demand, which obviously creates jobs. Richard, always great to have you with us. Thank you so very much. That's AFL-CIO President Richard Trumka. Coming up, we hear from one of those who resigned yesterday from the Trump administration, former OMB head and former acting chief of staff to the president, Mick Mulvaney. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The fallout has come fast and furious over the last 48 hours, the Capitol assault on Wednesday, including from prominent members of the Trump administration resigning as a result, and that included two members of his cabinet. One of those who resigned was Mick Mulvaney. He's the former head of the Office of Management and Budget and former acting chief of staff to President Trump. He resigned his position as special envoy to Northern Ireland. And we had a wide-ranging conversation yesterday, and I started out by asking him what really triggered his resignation right now. What was at stake? What was different yesterday was that people actually took it to heart in a way that manifested itself in illegal activity and, and a violently uh, illegal activity. That's where I think the underestimation was, is that there really were uh, a lot of people in this country, um, you know, maybe not a lot, but certainly enough yesterday to break the law to try and, 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 and frustrate our constitutional processes. Um, that's shocking to me because if the president ever walked into my office when I was chief of staff and say, hey, I'd like you to do something illegal, it, we all would have looked at him like he's nuts. We ought to would have quit if he was serious about it. That, that's, that we didn't really expect ordinary rank-and-file citizens to go, oh, yeah, it's a great idea for us to go break into the Capitol with guns in some circumstances and, and tear the place up. That's, not, that's, that's the disconnect. 
Um, that's that's what's so wrong about yesterday. And again, that's why I think you're seeing the resignation today. Well, as you say, Mick, and I certainly agree with you, uh, there's a, a history, even a rich history in this country of demonstration. I mean, it's in the First Amendment, after all, to petition for redress of grievances and to gather. There's no question about it. But in this instance, we had the president of the United States saying that the process was illegitimate. Not just he disagreed with it, but it was illegitimate. Doesn't that, to some extent, free people up to say, well, listen, if they're not legitimately in authority, if they're not doing something legitimate, Legitimate, then uh, then all bets are off. Doesn't that actually change the discussion? Yeah, I don't. I don't think it frees you up to do illegal activity. I mean, you have you have the right to be angry, but not the right to be violent. It doesn't excuse the president. Don't get me wrong. I'm not. I'm not trying to do that at all. But you don't get to say, oh, the president told me it's 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 illegitimate. Therefore, I I'm right to go do this. No, you don't. Um, and and you're not right to do that. And I do hope all those folks are prosecuted. Um, this was an act of sedition, I think. Um, it had been a long time since I practiced law, but I'm pretty sure this fits the definition of sedition, um, and they should be held accountable. Look, at Republicans uh, have been um, have been very vocal over the course of the last, uh, you know, six, eight months, 12 months, uh, about how much we despise the violence in the Black Lives Matter movement. And yet yesterday we go out, some of us, and, and, and do the things that are probably even worse. You know, setting fire to Minneapolis is one thing. Um, breaking into the Capitol is another especially given the day and the importance of the day and the constitutional import uh, of the day. So, um, like I said, it's, 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 it, the president is, is not, at, not faultless, there's no question, but just because the president tells you something doesn't make it right. That was part of my interview yesterday with former acting Trump chief of staff Mick Mulvaney. And a programming note, Wall Street Week will air tonight at 6 p.m. We will include former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers and Christina Hooper of Invesco as we try to wrap up a rather tumultuous and dramatic week that nevertheless the markets got passed. Coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. In our second hour, we're going to talk to two former candidates for president, both Tom Steyer and Carly Fiorina, about their thoughts on the developments this week. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on Bloomberg Radio.